my name is Mikey. I'm the founder and executive director of Project Camp, uh, who has not figured out how to manage the clicker, the note cards, and the microphone at the same time. So he's going to work on that. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about um, caring for children in disasters, and most specifically, the soft infrastructure investment that's required in order to do so. I'm going to talk to you about who we are, what we do, why that work is critical for our long-term mitigation recovery work, um, and how it actually can supercharge the work you're already doing. Uh, and I come to this work not as uh, someone from the emergency management space, but actually as a camp director. I grew up going to any sort of day residential camp after school program that my parents could shove me out the door to. Um, and it was actually in that experience uh, in Sonoma County working up on Porter Creek Road uh, at Camp Newman when the Tubbs fire hit. Uh, and it's where a lot of sort of my understanding of combining camp and creating this unique space for kids uh, inside of the crazy context of disaster. I want to start off really by talking about why camp is important to me. Um, like I said, I come from the camp environment. Um, as a kid, as a young adult, and as a professional, the reason camp was important to me is because it created a space for me to be my best self. Uh, I was around like-minded kids, able to make friends in an intentional environment, working with young adult professionals who were specifically tasked with making sure that I grew up into a better human being. Uh, and that's the environment that we create at Project Camp as well. We're at a unique inflection point. Uh, the climate crisis uh, is uh, increasing the frequency and severity of disasters. That's having a disproportionate impact on our low-income communities, our rural communities, our communities of color. That combined with a mental health crisis, with a loneliness epidemic, all create a perfect storm. Caring for kids allows parents simply to get back on their feet. The, the reverse of this is also true. Without investing in the soft infrastructure, without investing in childcare, parents cannot go to the fire line. Parents cannot show up to the hospital. Parents cannot show up to the EOC. Parents do not have the capacity to fill out the government forms we were just talking about. Uh, I want to share uh, this quote actually from one of our parents uh, during a Nor NorCal wildfire in 2021. Um, for her and for me, what it really highlighted was how camp really connected with the experience that her kids were having and the experience that she was having as a parent. And what we talked a lot about was really not that creating a safe space for kids was whitewashing her kids' experience of being evacuated, of living in a shelter for over two weeks, of that uncertainty and fear. What it was doing was creating another side of that story. It was creating a space for her kids to be able to um, feel that safety and that sense of return to being a kid, to be able to be in a space that's familiar. That's all the kind of stuff that allows our kids to be able to process. Play is how kids process. I want to talk a little bit about my experience during the Tubbs fire. Uh, Tubbs fire actually hit uh, on the last night of my honeymoon in 2017. Uh, and so I remember actually being uh, in the hotel with my wife and getting the Nixle alerts um, about our site up in Porter Creek. Um, really, once the fire hit, um, we were, didn't have access to our site anymore, but most importantly, we were checking in with our community members. So members of the Santa Rosa community, our site staff who lived on site up on Porter Creek Road. What they requested really was a clear layout of the crucial, jet, crucial gap in childcare, the fact that schools were closed, the need for parents to be able to return to work. We had families who were firefighters, families who were in hospitals, needed to be able to get to work, to be able to work with the rest of the community collectively on their response to the disaster. There was also a push for a return to a sense of normalcy, being able to have kids not at home or in the shelters, but in a space that they could readily identify, that could help them decompress and process what was going on in a way that's unique to them, like I said, through play. Uh, finally, the last thing we heard a lot from community members was a need to help. Uh, I'll use myself as an example. I, came, I come from the camp world. Uh, I am not a firefighter, so in the event of a wildfire, I am the last person you should send to the fire line. Um, but as a member of a community with a skill set in child care, um, this is something that we can readily access. And in all of our communities, we have access to a plethora of youth professionals, whether it's teen, young adults uh, with babysitting experience, after school care, camp counselors, teachers, um, all unique assets within our community. Um, a little bit how we responded. So um, two days after the fire broke out, uh, we worked with a synagogue in Santa Rosa to stand up a camp inside the synagogue. 
Uh, as many of you remember, the air quality was terrible. Um, when schools closed, there really wasn't a place for kids and families to gather. And so we transformed this synagogue into a day camp. We filled the halls, uh, we filled the halls with circus clowns and giant Connect Four and um, big blow up bounce houses. We utilized the commercial kitchen to be able to serve breakfast and lunch to our kids, many of whom didn't have access readily with their families to food every day. We served dinner on many occasions to whole families uh, during that period of uncertainty. What worked well, what worked best was the connection to parents, creating that space for kids uh, and being able to turn a space that um, was used for one thing into something that kids could readily recognize. The unique failure, the thing that was missing, was our connection to the wider community. The access point to Office of Education, to schools, to other after-school programs, to be able to share that resource widely within the community. Uh, for all this, for me, that was a, a light bulb moment. Uh, it was really about leveraging a space that kids could recognize at a really crucial moment in their development. Being able to take this moment where they're exposed to toxic stress and help jumpstart the mitigation of that turning into long-term trauma. Most importantly, and the thing that I think is most essential, is that it utilizes essential assets within our own communities. It takes a readily available resource, people who work with kids, like I said, and is tasked them with um, not something superficial, but something core to the long-term, lifelong impact of the kids in our communities. This is my central thesis, that childcare needs to be an essential part of every EOP at every level of government. Caring for kids supercharges response and recovery. Let's think for a second like uh, investors. Uh, what is one area where investors love to park their long-term uh, long returns? Farthest time horizon possible. In our context, that's kids. Being able to make the investments now in supporting our kids over the long-term has the longest, uh, what would be the right way of an investor saying this? The longest return on investment? Uh, the, be the best ROA. You can tell I didn't go to business school. Mitigation, prepara preparation, all this requires us to learn and adapt. Child care response has to adapt as well. Simply put, I agree when we close schools for disasters. I just don't think that's the end of the conversation. Um, some learnings from the Tubbs fire. First, uh, who hasn't been able to deploy um, on a disaster because they couldn't get child care in this room? Exactly. Um, this highlights the, the problem exactly. Um, being able to provide readily available, meaningful child care allows those who are first responders or first receivers to be able to do that work. We need to be able to include child care at every level of planning, whether it's bringing in organizations, individual staff um, from youth agencies or from uh, government agencies that work with children, bring all of those pieces to the table. If we wanna talk about resilience in our communities, providing care for children and families is exactly how we can do that. Uh, a little bit about Project Camp. So our mission is this. Uh, we provide care for children by extension, create relief for families uh, and resilience for communities. We do this because disaster relief wasn't designed with children in mind. Uh, we are creating a space that's unique to kids that they readily respond to and where they can process through play. We use camp because camp is inherently healing a therapeutic space. It's a mechanism of soft, soft infrastructure, and it's that kind of community infrastructure that is what community is. It's what creates a sense of, sense of place. It creates our community ties. It's the pieces that we rely on uh, when times are uncertain uh, for support. We're working right now uh, with our second camp in Maui, and I was floored by the ability for the Maui community and specifically the Native Hawaiian community in Maui to rally to support at times to um, faster than local government, faster than state or federal government, and in ways that spoke to the unique needs of families in Lahaina. What we do really is two sides of the same coin, and this is where it's important. First, we do a lot of preparation and organizing work to build the infrastructure and the networks to bring people together uh, to be able to provide plans to support kids in disasters. Like I said, it's preparing local government, schools, uh, rec departments, um, departments of health and social services, uh, all of which, boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, all of which in many ways work with many of the same kids, but don't actually work with each other around those kids. That's actually where I learned that from. Um, the second half of what we do uh, is 
response is popping up free trauma-informed day camps running from anywhere from a week to three weeks that provide that anchor child care support. Like I said, currently we're running our second camp in Maui, north of Lahaina, but we've operated these camps uh, in several states for wildfires, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, floods, uh, being able to provide crucial child care when normal child care services are disrupted. Oh yeah, I forgot. Samuel Jackson, everyone. Why camp works? This is crucial. Um, how many people have been to day or residential camp before or like have kids that go to camp? Okay, cool, yeah. Um, this is something that would be instantly recognizable. Uh, a structured environment where kids are checked in, sorted by cabins by their age group, and where they're rotating with uh, camp counselors to sports activities, arts activities, um, but all stuff that's meant to engage them both with friends and with meaningful adult role models. Uh, my favorite movie is actually The Sandlot, uh, and at the beginning of that movie, the mom has a really great quote uh, that kind of encapsulates all of this. She says to her son right before the summer um, that she wants him to run around, scrape his knees, get dirty, climb trees, hop fences, get into trouble for crying out loud. Not too much, but some. Uh, that's the environment that we're creating. Typically, the first couple of days with kids, they tend to be closed off, reserved. They listen to directions exceptionally well. Day three and day four, we start to see them really come out of their shell. We start to have a lot more energy at camp. We start to have a lot more moments of misbehavior, all of which are signs that camp is working. It's helping return them to a sense of a safe body that's allowing them to be in a safe brain. Uh, most importantly, camp is free and flexible. It's meant to be able to mold itself like a piece of geck uh, into uh, the immediate contours of the community in, in the space that we're able to provide. Fundamentally, if you take 10 great youth professionals and 100 kids and put them in that plaza right there, the kids can leave and say they had an experience of their lifetime. Um, the undergirding of all this is actually the ACE study from 2011, the Adverse Childhood Experience Study that CDC and Kaiser put together. Uh, it showed why investing in soft infrastructure is so important. It connected the long-term effects of experiencing toxic stress like a disaster with the lifelong physical, mental, and emotional toll that that can take on our kids. It also painted a roadmap to disrupt that process. It's rooted in building relationships, connecting to meaningful adults, being able to provide a sense of normalcy. Like I said, it's returning that sense of a safe body so that kids can start to feel have that sense of safe brain. Only then can they start to decompress, can they then share what's happening around them, and can they un understand that this incredible experience has happened, isn't happening, and that they're now able to move, start to move forward. The A study also points how we can connect a short-term impact with that long-term recovery mitigation. Being able to build the connective tissue uh, with collaboratives, with networks, really it's, it's honestly, it's tons of Zoom meetings. What we're talking about isn't building physical infrastructure. What we're talking about is connecting the right people who work with kids across our communities to be able to have the planning in place to do this work when disaster strikes. The knock-on effects are huge. The connection to youth mental health, to education outcomes long-term for our kids, to child and family poverty, we know that disaster has negative impacts on all of these things, and we know that providing structure for children and families can mitigate those impacts. Where to begin? Honestly, everyone in this room, I ask you to commit to putting childcare and mental health and their well being into your response plans. Connect now with schools, youth programs, youth organizations, and us so that we can all be ready to respond. And press disaster relief to be more focused on soft infrastructure. Commit to investing in community now. We'd love to work with you. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards and to answer some questions in my four minutes and 36 seconds left. Um, but that's the thing that I press is that doing this work now, being able to create that connective tissue is essential for our kids to be able to navigate these difficult times. Thank you for your time.